Welcome to another discussion that I'll have with a guest, an online acquaintance and friend whose name is Michael Britt, hailing from about as far in the lower 48 as you could be from me, straight across the country and I think up to the north a little bit. Michael has an interesting story and one that I think you'll find edifying of moving from King James Only Bible College and King James Only Pastor into what I would call an orthodox evangelical view of the text and the translation of scripture. I'm gonna have him tell that story and I'm gonna ask him why isn't he disaffected and angry and bitter. I think you're going to enjoy that. But first I want to ask you, Michael, how do you currently serve the body of Christ? So I, I currently serve the, the body of Christ as one of the pastors in my church in, in Topsom, Maine. And you're right, that is quite a stone's throw away from where you are. I also serve bivocationally, and that's actually where my office is right now. I'm, I'm at work and I serve as a as an office manager of an electrical contractor. I also have a podcast and a blog, and it's, it is with those things that I hope to serve the body of Christ. I've listened to a series in that podcast, and I think you have a good radio voice. I enjoyed it. You were talking about the King James Only controversy, and you really put some time in to do some homework and to serve your listeners. I really appreciated that. And I, I'm always on the lookout for people who have left King James Onlyism, as I have, who have some Bible training and therefore, Lord willing, some insight into the issues who might be able to help me understand how better to reach out to these brothers and sisters. But, and this is key to me, who are gracious, who are not angry. I'm, a, I'm about to go back and see in just a week my old church that I went to in high school, King James Only Church. By the time this comes out, I will have already gone there. And I'm really looking forward to it because I'm going to see some people that treated me really well. I just, I would feel like a horrible traitor to speak bitterly about them. And I've caught in you, Michael, the same kind of graciousness, though you would probably have some more reason for not being so gracious. And I want to turn to that. Let's talk about the way you once were. Where did you go to school? What was your view on the King James Version? And we'll move on from there. Sure. So, went to uh, Heartland Baptist Bible College. It's a, a school full of people who love the Lord and want to serve the Lord. And, and obviously in a slightly different nuance than I do, right? Their own denominational tradition and things of that nature. But went there, graduated, and from there came up to Maine. I worked with another pastor at a church here north of me. And, and served as his assistant, the children's pastor, youth pastor, music director, just a typical second man role. I also was invited to teach a semester at a Christian school nearby, preach and teach in Christian schools and chapels and things like that. And of course, one of my sticking points was, you know, warning the the current generation, the next generation of the, the evils and the confusion and chaos of the the perversions and things of that nature. And that was actually one of the, the the highlights of my ministry and one of the reasons why I was invited to, to speak, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why was because I, I had done my research and I had a very convincing presentation of why the King James translation was the perfectly preserved word of God for English speaking people. Um, what were some of the leading arguments that you would use in, you know, let's say you're invited to a church or you're teaching a Christian school, sure. what kinds of arguments were you turning to? What the biggest the biggest one, and I think that this would be the case with, with anyone who considers themselves to be learned in this area, the biggest one is obviously the, the text line, right? You had your text line from Alexandria and your text line from Antioch and ne'er the two shall meet, right? And there and I can see the charts in my head now, both of them descending from the top of the paper in parallel columns, you know, and, and all of the, the prose written in there about this particular and of course when you present that as fact and you say, Hey, here's how it was and you're you're wearing glasses and a bow tie, who's gonna question you, right? You know, it's it's so that that was one of the biggest arguments was the the text the, the original text, I would probably have called it the, the Tectus Receptus or even the Byzantine or things like that. That's that's not corrupted, but these these other texts, these are corrupted. You know, you got the Roman Catholics over here with Vaticanus and what's it doing in the Vatican anyway? And then Sinaiticus, well, that was just a modern day Indiana Found Jones, in trash you know, can. Count Fish. Yeah, exactly right. In a burn pile in an apostate monastery, I said right. in my curriculum. And okay. yeah, it's all, it's all about it's all about the rhetoric, you know, it's all yeah. about making the case as, as convincingly as you can. Luridly. Uh, 
Yes. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the the substance undergirding those undergirding those those arguments was was not sufficient for for yeah. to be able and, to and support we'll, something. We'll like get that. there. Let's sure, let's talk sure. a little bit more about where yeah. you were. So, mm-hmm. in one sense, you you were closer to evangelical orthodox bibliology than Ruckmanism, because for you the focus was the text, not so much the translation. And in that, you were reflecting, were you not, the position of Heartland? What were you taught at Heartland Baptist Bible College? Did you, did you carry that on into these settings? I did. And in fact, with, with, it was certainly taught there, and with absolutely, you know my heart, I know yours, with zero misanthropy toward anyone at Heartland, of course. But there's, right right when we graduated, it was, you know, you line up just before you, you walk out to get your diploma, and they say, hey, listen, if you ever, you know, abdicate your beliefs in the King James Bible, you need to send your diploma back, you know, it's 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 a nice way of saying you're dead to me, right? <laughs> so, now, wait um, a minute, wait a minute. They, that, they, yeah. they took you individually, every individual graduate, and they say that, or there's a room of you before you go there's out and they say that to you? Yep, just before you graduate, there's a room. The, the pastor and president at the time would he comes and he gives you your final your final exhortation, as it were, and he says, "All right, now here's the thing. You know, these are these are the distinctives that we've taught at Heartland, and if you ever leave these distinctions behind, then." He, he felt that it's not intellectually honest anymore to call yourself a Heartland graduate. And I can understand okay. the spirit behind that. But he said, yeah, send your diploma back. You know, don't. Uh, so. And so that, that I, I say all that to to underline that the teaching wasn't just in one class. It, it, it was a vein that, that went in every class, right? That, yeah. you know, the King James Bible is the Word of God, perfectly preserved, et cetera, et cetera. But like I say, and like you've mentioned to their credit, it, it wasn't Ruckmanism, like, like I later saw when I got out of college and, and, and worked at a church up here. It was it was more balanced, I think, in that regard. And I actually do think that there's, there's well, I don't want to get ahead of it. I'm thinking there is an intellectually tenable way to hold some of the newer translations in reservation. Absolutely. Yeah. But not for reasons <laughs> of, of, of yeah. yeah. And it, w- one of the difficulties I've observed, guys coming out of Heartland and West Coast and Crown and Ambassador or what have you, major King James only Bible colleges, if they got a more responsible version of King James onlyism in school, and they don't always, my observation, and I don't have a, you know, scientific proof for this, is that some of them come in with Ruckmanism and they leave with Ruckmanism that hasn't really been challenged sufficiently. But I do think that some of the better students, and I can name some names here that have gone to some of these places, they come out seeing the distinction between Ruckmanism and the official position of the school. And I, you know, I see that as a good step in the right direction. But when they go out into ministry, frequently they're finding that actually the pastors who send kids to that school are, for all practical purposes, Ruckmanites. And there was a student at Heartland. One of these days, I'd love to be able to interview him, but I I managed to get access. I just saw online somewhere he shared some of the results of a survey he did, he did as a part of a, a master's thesis, I think, there, where he's surveying pastors in the Heartland constituency. And he's revealing, I mean, obviously, that there's tons of Ruckmanism out there that guys are treating the King James as itself perfect. For example, I don't remember the percentages, but, you know, so many pastors were willing to, you know, support missionaries who translated not from the Hebrew and Greek into whatever the language is and, you know, Indonesia or whatever, but they're translating from the King James or they treat or they say that the King James is itself perfect in every way, which can only happen under inspiration, that kind of thing. So is that indeed then what you encountered when you went out into ministry? Very much so, to, to the point where exactly as you said, it was practical Ruckmanism, not where anybody would identify as a Ruckmanite, right? Because I think everybody has their own baggage or connotation around what they say, oh, this is Ruckmanism, this is Lamarckism, whatever. But what's in a name, right? Essentially, in fact, this kind of bleeds into kind of a, a hinge moment for me, so I won't go into that right now. But in, in one of my very last conversations in a pastors get together, all of all of whom were sent out from this particular local church. So when I went back to this local church for every other, every every four or five months, we get together and meet. At the very last one of these, we got to talking about the King James translation. And and as, as fallacious as this sounds, the observation was made that if, if someone doesn't speak or read 
English. They need to learn to speak or read English in order to have uh. the perfectly preserved Word of God. And I was, I was, Mark, I was gobsmacked. I had no idea what to do with a sentence like that. And I'd right. heard things like that caricatured in arguments before, but I'd never heard anyone present it accurately. Well, the other two preachers who were in the room, I kind of looked around the room and I'm like, do you guys, do you, do you guys agree with this? You know, what the, what kind of the head preacher said. And they're like, yeah, no, that follows. That makes sense. It's, you know, and I says, well, well now, and so I repeated it back to them. I wanted to make sure I was not misrepresenting what they said because it sounds yeah. so strange. And I said, so you're really saying that, that unless someone learns to speak English and they said, yes, after all, it's, it's the Chinese who are learning English, not Americans who are learning Chinese, as if that was some sort of, you know, well, there you have it, right? The proof yeah. of the pudding's in the eating. <laughs> Number one, not only is that not accurate at all, but, right. but he, I mean, and so, of course, all the follow-up questions, well, then what did they do for 1,600 years before? What did, you know what I mean? And all that. But, but you, again, I don't want to put the cart too far ahead of the horse, but that, that's the sort of thing I encountered. And it's played pretty close to the vest because... I don't know that anyone really wants to put that right out there and say that, right? Mm, they they um, recognize at some level that that's extremist. And 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 frankly, without it's absurd. It really is absurd on yeah. its face. It doesn't it doesn't have any. There's no sense there. And, and unbiblical. And, yeah. Romans it's ten. Staggeringly so. Yeah, and and actually, just the hour before, I was interviewing Aaron Shryock. I don't know when these interviews will come out on my channel, so I don't know which order will go in. But he wrote an article about reasons why we translate the Bible into the vernacular, and he was trying to make a biblical argument. You know, the Bible isn't very explicit about this. The Bible doesn't sure. command Bible translation, but the Great Commission sure seems to imply it strongly. And then the way the Bible is supposed to function in the Christian community makes a lot better sense if it's translated into the language of the people. And I just think of Romans 10, how shall they hear without a preacher? A preacher. And it's it's like, it's so obvious that that requires translation that it didn't even need to be said. But it is said in Acts 2. God could have revealed through Peter at Pentecost, all of you must learn Aramaic or whatever language he cared to speak. All of you must learn Greek, I, should, I suppose, sure. Koine Greek, sure. in order to access the true scriptures. But instead, from the very beginning of the church, the Bible has been translated into the vernacular. And that's exactly what the King James translators were doing. And they would roll over in their graves. I believe they're in heaven, so they don't need to do that. But they would roll around in heaven on the clouds yeah. or whatever, on the golden yeah, on the streets. Cloud, they'd roll on the clouds. Yeah. Well, hasn't that been one of the hallmarks of Christianity, Mark, is, yeah. is that we've always been faithful to preserve, for lack of a better word, the text in the vernacular of people's languages. There, there really is no other major world religion that engages in this at all by comparison. Well, um, Islam does, you know, there are translations of the Quran sure. into major languages, but they really explicitly say only the Arabic is really God's word. And we don't say that as Christians. We cut we cut Correct. it more finely. It's more nuanced. We yes, the Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and the and Daniel and Ezra, I think, those are what are immediately inspired. But in so far as those words are accurately translated, the consistent Christian position over time has been that those are also God's word, and the King James translators say this very ex explicitly, uh, right in their preface. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Tim would know. Tim Berg, our mutual friend, would know a lot more about this. But to read to read the preface and to come away with any view that is as outlandish as the one I encountered, it's, it's a non sequitur. You you can't have both. But we skip the preface. Yeah, the the preface. Uh, that's another discussion. I've had Joshua Barzon yeah. on, on here to talk about that. Let's let's get the cart and the horse back together and let's keep going to sure. that hinge yes. point. So so you are. I don't know if you're a poster boy, but you're certainly continuing what you were taught and holding to the party line. But then things start to concern you, and you kind of got toward the hinge point already. But I want to know, when did things start to concern you? I have to feel it was somewhat before that moment at that preacher's meeting. When did you yeah. first notice, wow, around me, this isn't quite right? Yeah. Oh, your, your, your intuition is, is correct. It certainly didn't begin at that preacher's meeting. Otherwise, I would have just nodded and smiled and ate the next cookie, right? For me, it actually began with, uh, as as popular as this sounds today, a, a, a deconstruction of sorts. I, I had found that a lot of my faith was not coherent with the real world. And 
one of the things that fell apart among many, unfortunately, I say unfortunately, but it was a necessary process. But one of the things that fell apart a lot more quickly was this this idea of of a it's English exclusive preserved Bible, as though you know it, it's, it's a very Anglo centric ideal, right. right? And it just kind of God is a respecter of nations in this view, <laughs> right? Correct, and and so that that began to crumble just and again. It, Part of it was, Mark, because I had bigger things to worry about. I was calling all kinds of things into question. I, I was reading a little bit of Bart Ehrman and a little bit of, you know, the, the, the four atheist horsemen, right? You know, the, these guys, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, and, and all them. And, of course, uh, Richard Dawkins, right? And I wasn't reading after them, you know, deeply. I, I, I just said, okay, well, these guys have points. Has, has Christianity done anything to answer these points? And not to, re- not to wander into that realm, but my point is to say I had way bigger fish to fry, Right. And so I was looking at like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was looking at, you know, the, the, the gospel beauty of the gospel. I was looking at creation. I was looking at the historicity of the biblical accounts and miracles and things like that. And then as I wandered into that world, I noticed that really no, frankly, no serious qualified scholar was saying anything about the King James Bible. It was almost like a moot point. Now, some might rebut and they might say, well, that doesn't mean it's, well, I, I recognize that, but... but it, So now you, you mean fact, that you're, you're yeah. looking for Christian scholars, apologists to help you mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in combating the views of the four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse and, and the people you're finding that are helpful to you in retaining your Christian faith they are not King James only Is that what you're saying? Correct. Because they're logisticians. They're, they're, they're thinking. They're, and, and I don't mean that. That sounds very derogatory. I don't mean to be rude. But, but once you actually go to the conclusions of some of these lines of thought, then you reach the absurdity. You know, the King James only, only in English and stuff. And, and these, these men, they wouldn't even deal with folly like that because they say we, we deal in facts, right? We deal in history. And when I started living in that world of what's true, I want to know what's true. And, when, and th- with this deconstruction process in my life, the, the shedding of all, all pride and ego was, was it, it happened. I didn't care what I looked like. I didn't care that I wouldn't ever be asked to preach somewhere again or go back to my alma mater and preach in a chapel. Those were achievements to me. Now, the only achievement was that I got the truth. I want the truth. And when I let go of a lot of that bias that was necessarily propelling my ministry, number one, my ministry stopped propelling. That was a problem in and of itself because I didn't even know who I was anymore, what I believed, what kind of church I was pastoring. This was a mess. But the one thing as I began to rebuild my faith, the one thing that wasn't coming along with it is this this baggage of the King James only translation that I had begun to see as 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 more of the same more emotional rather than factual fideism more, more yeah exactly yeah and 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 that's when I began to say well what would happen if we did you know read a newer translation and see what you know and and then then there was the the objection well they leave out parts well do they leave them out or do they correct what was inserted by a later interpolation, right? And these things I had to address bit by bit. So it wasn't sudden for me, Mark. It was it was gradual. And then I began to become very comfortable with help of books like this one, authorized the use and misuse, because there's people who are just saying, We just want the truth. And and when I got into a metaphorical room full of those kind of people, intellectually honest people who say, I don't have to be right. I just want the truth. I don't have to win. None of these people were advocates for the more, what I now rightly see as, as, as outlandish views right. on, on a particular English translation. They're just, yeah. frankly, there's just no room for it in right. a discussion of, of people who, who know the facts. Yeah. I mean, I think a King James only is to listen to this far and, you know, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I can't imagine that many people are listening, but I think some will. If you've listened this far, I I think I can anticipate your objection in saying, well, here's a guy who got into Bart Ehrman and that messed him up. Or here's a guy who started reading atheists and, and that messed him up. And hey, just because a bunch of, you know, pointy-headed scholar types don't take the view doesn't mean you need to get embarrassed by the truth. But but I'd, I'd rather put it a different way. It's it's very similar to what my friend, friend Nathan Cravat said, Recovering Fundamentalist podcast, he said that growing up, 
his parents were King James only. They weren't Rachmanites. They did see a distinction there. Maybe it was a little fuzzy in their minds. But when they picked him up from school, they would listen to John MacArthur and Tony Evans and Alistair Begg or whoever it was on the radio. And he would hear these excellent sermons from the Bible as a kid. I think even at that point in his life, I think he was not regenerated, not saved, but he still recognized and remembered years later that they were delivering real edification and giving more actual Bible than the camp meeting, hollering, you know, folks that he was hearing, yes. like literally hundreds yes. of sermons from over time. And he remembers asking his parents, what, how is it that, you know, Tony Evans can preach such a good sermon or John MacArthur can preach such a strong biblical sermon, but he's using a different translation? I thought they were all, you know, heretical. And then the, his parents said, well, no, you know, maybe they're just not the best, but they're still okay. I, I would like to take that, that feeling that Nathan had and that you had, recognizing here are people who are rescuing my faith or helping me make sure that I'm reconstructing it. And it's noticeable that none of them are taking this viewpoint. Apparently it isn't necessary to a biblical faith. I think that's something that the King James only viewer of this interview should humbly take on board and make him or herself answer. How is it that so many obviously godly people who are handling the Bible carefully, who preach it faithfully, who stand up in the culture that is opposed to them, how is it that they're not seeing this thing that our crowd says is utterly essential for true Christian faith. I spoke a little too long. I want to hear your story more, but I just I just had to kind of amen that no, that's, that portion that's so of your of your story. So there, there there's well, the sort of a beginning hinge moment. Let's keep the story going. How did it go after sure. that? Sure. Well, it, it was it was I was in the throes of that discovery, right? Where I was recognizing, wow, fundamentalism has kind of shunned scholarship and treating it like it's a bad word, right? And they say, oh, just me and my Bible, that's all I need. I don't even need a strong concordance. I'm just going to let the word speak to me, that sort of thing, right? And I'm like, no, this this is insufficient, right? So that's, before too long, I ended up at that pastor's meeting. And it, it wasn't a preaching type meeting. We were just sitting around eating a meal, fellowshipping together, which was nice, you know? But then the discussion happened, and it was then that I that I saw the 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 reductio ad absurdum the uh, the the point at which if you follow someone's line of thinking to the end how absolutely uh, untenable it is intellectually right and that's when i began to say i don't think i want to avow myself as a king james onlyist anymore because i see where it leads i see where it necessarily leads and i know that and i have and will continue to have accusations of leftist and woke or whatever but there's there are very strong anglo-centric imperialist overtones to the king james only movement and english speaker overtones right and we're so we're so it's very part and parcel to the strange new world or uh, truman truman just wrote yeah yeah, yeah. anyways sorry this expressive individualism that right, says right. i interpret all things through my own lens right and the king james only basically says we're looking at this as it pertains to us and our group but it doesn't broaden that view and so the hinge point for me was when i got out of that meeting i was talking to my wife and i said something to the effect of i hope i didn't ever sound like that I hope I didn't ever come across that way, but if you'd followed my arguments, it would have inevitably resulted in the exact same conclusion that I was unwilling right. to face or follow that right. trail down. And uh, so that's when I said, no, I, 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 I'm not there. I'm not that way. And after several more conversations and further years of developing a theology wow. around the Bible, I finally came to the conclusion of saying, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm boldly not King James only. I think that's a very unfortunate and unhelpful position to take and it and it's like you said at the beginning really flies in the face of all the efforts of translations and translational committees and 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 it's like you've said several times in your book you know you've got false friends you've got interpolate you've got all sorts of things that need to be deeply considered and not to go on a rabbit trail or preach here just one sentence long i think that this abdication of work and a a gathering of instantaneous gratification really plays into subconsciously pragmatically however our reading of the bible where we just want to be able to read it and say that's what that's what my bible says that god said it that settled it, it's good enough for me but 
as Michael Heiser, the late Michael Heiser used to say, Bible study is not for sissies, right? We've got to we've got to be able to open the word and say, okay, and do the work. And I think that's what some of these translational committees have done for us already. And so when you open up, and besides, Mark, how many times have you heard somebody preach in a King James only church? They'll read a verse, then they'll spend the next five minutes defining it, and then they'll preach from it, right? And that was actually I. I was going to mention this and I didn't. That was kind of a pre-hinge moment for me. I had an older mm-hmm. man who attended my church and he came and met with me in my office and he, he asked me to consider using a newer translation. And then he brought up that very point. He says, he says, Michael, sometimes when you preach, you spend the first 10 minutes of your sermon telling people what words wow. mean and what they don't mean. He said, and I've got a Bible on my lap that already did that for me. <laughs> and I looked at him, and, and of course, that's when I brought up, this was back in my King James Only days, I said, yeah. well, the text, you know, the corrupted text is that and the other, but that stuck with me, Mark. It stuck wow. with me. And now I use that same refrain for others when I say, you're doing so much extra work yeah. and padding your sermon with 15 extra minutes, that that, that work has already been done <laughs> by right. people, frankly, frankly, more qualified, more qualified. than you right. to, to make those decisions. And, Mark, how much false doctrine and and denominational schisms could we have avoided or might we still avoid by the use of allowing scholars to do the work alongside us and for us and we can benefit alongside. from that. Right. 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 It's not it's not everyone's yeah, anyway, sorry, I'm getting a little preaching. No, this is good. I, I guess I guess that's the crux of my point is and it goes back to that rejection of scholarship. You say, uh, and, it, and it's a wariness, and it's a mistrust. And we say, they even had a woman on their translational committee, I heard right. one person say. Well, heaven forbid, heaven forbid there could be a brilliant woman who, can, who knows the Greek backwards and forwards and the Hebrew up and down. Someone like Carmen Imes, who is a Hebrew scholar. Janine Brown of the NIV. And it's like... And then, of course, the character assassinations, and I've heard Timber right. deal with this effectively, is, you know, well, there were blood-drinking, devil-worshipping. It's all hearsay. It's all, it's, it's yeah. frankly slander. It, it's slander. It's, it's a right. last resort. It's a last resort attack to make you not right. want to trust the diligence and hard work. And if right. you read these translations right at the beginning, they're very upfront about the methods they use, what right. they want you to be aware of. what they. But again, this all goes back to skipping the preface, but... Yeah. Anyways. Now, it's interesting. You say, you talk about the guy who came up to you and said, well, you're spending 15 minutes of your sermon defining words. Yeah. Actually, before that, you talked about, you've heard many preachers do that, spend 10 minutes. I thought you were going to say, how many times have we heard preachers in King James only circles read a verse and then completely depart from it and just say all kinds of stuff that maybe a lot of it actually is true, but not at all connected to the Bible passage. I mean, that's even more common in my experience. So I actually have a lot of hope, a lot of hope for the young preacher who bothers to notice that yes. the King James verbiage is difficult to understand and just intuitively knows I better explain it. I better explain the English so I can get a chance to explain the verse. I feel like that yes. guy is actually, without knowing it, teetering on the edge of coming into our position because yes. He's, yes. he's recognizing that this can be expressed in our English, this same truth. Yes. So you got yourself to that point. You had these multiple kinds of hinge moments. I want to know more about the break. How did that come about? Sure. Interestingly, it was... And, and I'm not trying to I'm not trying to blame you for this, but it was when you started talking about false friends, both in your written in written work and in other and other content that you published online. I think how many did you cover on your channel? I mean, you went through so many of them. All these. I'm false up to friends. about and 75 you, right now, and I've got dozens more that I could do. Correct. And it was that discussion that I began to realize how vo- volatile is not the right word. How how bridged people on what was then my side got when you even brought that up, right? right? In fact, in your book, you list, I think there's like 15 false friends. And then at the very last one, you said, I didn't know this one existed until a friend pointed it out to me and it yeah. was abstain from all appearance of evil. Right. And I think it was like number 15 or whatever. And and that was actually one of the ones that, that I used with people in our church to, to demonstrate or to commend, no, I'm just joking, to demonstrate yeah. the, the ineffectuality of a phrasing like that in the 21st century vernacular in English, right? In today's English, right? And how we would do that. So the break happened when I was doing 
so much of that that people had already decided for me that I was no longer King James only. People had already made that decision on my part. And then I leaned into it and I said, well, well frankly, if, if this is what it means to not be King James only, then of course I, I, I'm not King James only. Because, and, and here's, here's what I want to say, and it might sound a bit abrasive. Mark, I don't think anybody really is King James only because for the reason I mentioned, if you get up there and you preach, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, what this means is every instance of evil, if you're going to preach it right, you could preach it wrong. And, and, and I did a whole podcast episode called The Forbidden Isles on preaching that text wrong. But, but if you're going to preach it right, you are going to be doing some retranslating of your own. You are. Hmm. And you're going to call it a paraphrase. You're going to call it, I jokingly call it the microbrit version, the MBV, whenever I'm teaching on our small group on Wednesday. Every, every, just about every Wednesday night, I type a personal paraphrase of the text that we're talking about, and, hmm. I, and, I, and I read it to the church. And there are people who've been saved for 60, 70 years who are nodding and saying, Pastor, that paraphrase really helps me understand. That's great. Because in our church, we're still using the King James for intergenerational unity. That's our purpose. Sure. That's why we do it. And, and if I were on a desert island and you only gave me one translation of the Bible, it would be the King James. I know it best. I love it. I trust hmm. it. Great. But, but I'm far from King James only. And in fact, in my leisure reading, I don't usually read the King James. If I'm studying, I'm studying all kinds of languages and translations, right? But yeah. but this lady, she she nods and, and she says, wow, I understand it so much better. When you said it, she's been reading the King James for 60, 70 years. I mean, well, 50, 60 years. She's been reading yeah. the King James. And now, five, six decades later, she's saying, wow, I understand it so much better. How, how, how long does she have to wait? Right? Because she's been trapped in this right. whole, well, it's corrupt, it's corrupt. But my paraphrase is just that, Mark. It's just a paraphrase that I wrote in an hour. Can you imagine a whole committee of people who love the Lord fervently, who are exceptionally right. qualified, who are writing a translation that can help someone understand? Anyways, this all I can imagine. Break. Yeah. I know these people. <laughs> right. I don't have to use my imagination. Right? Yes. They exist. Of course. I've met them. And, and so the break, happened, the break happened gradually, and I finally became public with it, I suppose, when I was doing my podcast. And even in my podcast, I included an episode called Why You Should Use the King James Translation. I'm drawing a little bit of inspiration from your work, of course, because I think there are still very valid reasons to use the King James. We should not chuck it. Right. But but with that, it was it was very apparent, you know, that Michael Breed is now a leftist, liberal, progressive, neo-evangelical, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And and the 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 hubris, the epistemological hubris, the the, 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 pride, the pride, the arrogance that some people will just they won't even the thing that makes me very glad that the break eventually happened, what I look back at where I was and I see mm. in others what, how I used to treat people like me now, our mutual yeah. friend Tim, when I heard that he was no longer one of us, yeah, I, I, I dragged him through the mud, Mark. I said, well, yeah. you know, he left like all those other people do. And I later had to call him and apologize. I, mean, I heard I was about one this. Of the one. That meant a right? lot to me. And, and, and I, now, I don't know. Now I, now I'm, now I'm, now he's, I, frankly, he's one of my heroes, right? Because yeah. he was one of the ones who was in our class who was brave enough to say, well, I'm, I'm going to take the and path diligent and the difference. And diligent enough, right? And he was so gracious and irenic. I learned the word irenic from him. So gracious and irenic in how he handled it. That he was an example for all of us. And I'm not just right. a praise Tim Berg moment, but people like him are, are a big help to me. And then when I look back and say, but these guys are, you know, whether on Facebook or in person, hardly ever in person, I've noticed. But, but on social media and, and when people talk about me, my former pastor preached last year a two-part sermon on how I departed from the faith. To, to my sending church behind closed doors, and they didn't stream it, so I didn't get to hear it, but it was related to me. Yeah, he just got done preaching a two-part sermon on how Michael Britt departed from, uh, departed from sound doctrine. Sorry, departed from sound doctrine. Okay, that is different. It is. It is. I apologize. But departed from sound doctrine. And I wonder, like, no one ever reached out to me. No one ever said, hey, man, is this true? From that church. One person eventually did, another pastor who's a dear friend, and another lady from the church eventually reached out to me. And, uh, and But but in a church of over 100 people, including a pastor who I we were very dear friends, so I say that was very wrong of them to do that, yes, but... Number one, I used to do that to people all the time, hmm. all the time, because they weren't, they didn't count anymore. They didn't right. count. Once somebody leaves, you're allowed to slander. You're allowed to, you right. know, one, yeah, because they're not, 
Right. They're, they're just a bunch of heretics. They might as well be whoever, right? But also because I, I have that pride, I was so sure I was right, so sure. Because I was taught mm-hmm. that I was right by people who were taught that they were right, by people who were taught that they were right. And then you've got a whole, you've got several generations of people who are very solid and confident in what they believe with, you know, and they're yeah, wrong. Who, you know? who effectively never venture out to a place where they could really get challenged. And, and on certain issues, I do that, right? Like, I'm not going to name the sure. issues, but I'll get very broadly speaking, you know, I'm not a biologist. And so I'm not going to wander into the evolutionary biology journals and try to combat them on that ground. I recognize sure. you can't. You, you, we're all going to believe some things that we know we're trusting others to tell us. The, no, I'm not. Okay, this gets complicated because, of course, the Bible tells us things, and that's why I take the view I do on creation evolution. But when it comes to this kind of thing where you you know, you, you have to know, there are other people who at least say they believe the gospel, who at least give an indication of caring about living holy lives and of sharing that gospel. And historically, of course, that's been true. You know, how many King James only have there been in the whole history of the world? I, I really think then that social media is playing a big role in the in the departures from King James only mm-hmm. that I see mm-hmm. practically every day from yeah. younger folks because you just can't deny. You go online and there's your cousin sharing a verse. Yes, it's from the NIV, but you're seeing that person really does love the Lord. You're seeing yeah. that person is asking for prayer for their sick spouse or that person is giving the gospel to people and mentioning it. It's just so much harder, I think, to demonize literally all of the rest of professing Christendom when you can see online that that just isn't accurate. And I do think that the spirit indwelling individual Christian souls certainly indwells those of King James only as who believe the gospel and repented of their sins. And there's something in them, therefore it is the spirit where they want to have unity and love toward fellow Christians. And that is going to attack the foundation of King James onlyism. So now I'm getting a little confused. You were pastoring as an assistant in this church or you were a head pastor i i'm getting mixed up sure so that you're not the only one who gets mixed up when i talk i i go everywhere i apologize so when i first came to maine i worked with a pastor up up north not northern maine but you know in the capital and and i was his assistant pastor and over the next couple of years while i was on staff i guess i don't really know how to put it kind of graduated into more of a associate pastor role as it were i'm not really sure about the nomenclature of these things but i wasn't i wasn't i I baptized you know i i did but i wasn't the lead pastor and i was i was in that situation for a couple of years before i became the pastor of the thompson baptist church in 2015 2015 yeah yeah okay so So, upshot you're not a gospel denying heretic, are you? No. No, no I'm not. No, I'm you not. You believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, rose again the third day, and reigns in or and, and will reign for all eternity? Absolutely. I like the first one better. He reigns. He reigns. No, yeah. I'm, just, I'm being nitpicky. No, no I agree. I do. I, I agree with I that do. too. I was trying not to too much offend my dispensationalist <laughs> brothers there. You believe that you have an obligation to live a holy life. Yes. Do you yeah. believe that the Bible is God's word? I do. It's inspired and true. Everything that affirms is true. Everything that it says is false is false. Yeah, That's you're in. Right. You do you have any nervousness about calling yourself an inerrantist? No, I I don't. I think I think a word needs nuance because only because when a lot of people say I'm an inerrantist, there's baggage on that, right? And we tend to think what kind of inerrantist, right? But everything that it means to teach and affirm is true, and everything that it denies is worthy of denial. It is Care- careful evangelicals who've worked to define inerrancy have Absolutely. said the same thing. Um, right. There, there, there are irresponsible ways to put that forward, but sure. Yeah, um, in the most the responsible sense, absolutely, I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, and 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 it can be, and it is offensive to mm-hmm. have fellow Christians suggest to you that maybe you're not a Christian uh, right. because you have problems with King James onlyism. You know, I, I get this. Right. 
probably once a week, once every two weeks, a commenter on my YouTube channel who will say, if only you were saved, you would understand these words. And I always just try to clarify, like, do you really mean that? I, I, right. I, it's, and then to have people that know you say that kind of thing to you. I haven't had that experience. It, sure. It's tough. So let me, yeah. let, me, let me end then with this question that we talked about in advance. How come you can be gracious? I mean, you've been clear, you've been firm, you've disagreed. You've called out sin and slander in other people, but you don't seem unhinged, disaffected, and bitter. Why? Three points. No, I don't really have three points. I suppose I could break it into three points. One, because of the example of others. I know it can be done, right? Primarily Christ, of course, but others, like you know I mentioned to him, but there have been many others who have, in a mo Pete Montoro, who in a yeah, most, he's a great example. Oh, he really is in such a charitable way. Uh, so the example of others, right? The other is it's cruciform. It's cruciform. If how, how do I say this? If if people if if I can't take a, a barb or a slight and and not want to lash out, I think that reflects my personal spiritual development or lack thereof, right? But then third, and I guess this is probably the most compelling one for me. It's I was right there. I was right there. Yeah. I was the yeah. person who did that. And you know what someone said to me once? They said, actually, more than one person said this to me once. They said, it is so interesting how the people from the, the neo churches, you know, with the, the, the basketball courts, or the, no, the gyms are allowed in fundamentalism. I don't know what else is not allowed. Anyways, with the, with the drums and the, and the mohawks, how they treat people better then hmm. and so that stuck with me and i thought i i used to berate assassinate slander i i don't like it maybe i don't like to talk about it i was awful mark i was i was awful and i was so arrogant and now i look back and i say and i look at everybody who does that to me through that lens of yeah. genuine compassion not because well i'm up here now and i no 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 but like i i i know where they're coming from and yeah. and and i can't be upset with them any more than i would have been an upset with uh, upset with myself it's the parable um, and, of the unforgiving yeah. servant in yeah. in a little bit different mode because that's talking sure. about salvation from all of our sins and that should be true right. of all christian interactions but in a very real way it's actually more like you owed the 120 denarii that somebody else owes you. Not only did you, owe, did you owe that big debt to God because of your sin, but you did owe this to other people. And yeah. putting a little bit finer point on it, because I'm about to say something nice about you here, you were an adult man doing this. Yeah. You know, yeah. you weren't just a college kid who's accepting right. what he's being taught, but still processing it and, you know, somewhat unthinkingly spouting it off. No, you went around and taught about it. And what I want to say nice about you is I've now talked to, you know, plenty of ex King James onlyists, mostly privately, occasionally publicly here on my channel. And one thing that I've kind of been praying for, not just kind of, I have been over years, over the years, is to see some leading King James onlyists not only change their minds, but publicly apologize. And institutions who have promoted these falsehoods and these unity harming falsehoods, even though they believed that they were right at the time, they certainly were not and are not consciously lying. You brought up slander. Well, Tim Berg and I were just talking this morning on my way into work. Westcott and Hort get slandered right and left. Well, we've got Bible passages telling us that we're not supposed to do that. And yet here are people repeating slanders against them that they've never checked out. I've never encountered a King James only as, and, and uh, Tim can say this with even more authority, who's spent any time trying to actually look at what Westcott and Hort have said, except for some of the major leaders like right. D.A. Waite, who are twisting their words. You know, what responsibility do those people have when they come to realize that what they've done is wrong? It's the Christian responsibility we all have when we sin. When I sin against my kids and I get mad at them and I yell at them, I have to swallow my pride and I have to right. go tell them, Daddy is sorry, I sinned, please will you forgive me? You have done that and it just makes me rejoice. You are an answer to one of my prayers. I'm not hearing self-defensiveness here, even though you could. You could blame the people that taught you and they do bear blame. They do. They did not give you the opportunities in that system to 
and, and the encouragement to, to find the truth on this matter. Nonetheless, you've taken responsibility. And that is just such a profoundly Christian thing to do. And it's supposed to, it's not supposed to make you proud. Hey, not only did I come to the right position, but I actually said sorry for it. It's supposed to give you the spirit that you seem to me to be evidencing both in this conversation and in online stuff that I've seen from you, where you're recognizing, yeah, this is a permanently humbling thing. I did this. And so it helps me understand where other people are coming from. That just means a lot to me. And I wanted to say that to you. Well, I'm, I'm thankful you said that. And I'll, one good turn deserves another, Mark. I I really am indebted to your book. It's, Thank a, you. it's, it's such a short, easy book. And here's the best part. It is so disarming because it's so small. And you think, well, I could I could get away with, with reading this. And, and of course, you know, you open it up and you have Frame and Carson and Schreiner right in the very beginning of it, right? But but you, you, you open up this book and and it's it's as your approach has always been. It is never beating someone over the head with the truth. It's ushering them into the truth and saying, hey, come look at this with me, right? And I hope that that will be the approach of many people in our generation. And I, I won't even say the next generation, Mark, because to be very frank with you, I'm kind of hoping that this whole fool's errand this is whole eradicated thing dies out. by the time. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, I can't honestly yeah. say I think that will happen, but I can say that I have heard from literally hundreds and I stopped counting after 200. I, I actually actually sat down and counted how many friend requests I got on Facebook from guys who were clearly trained in King James only. As we're talking usually guys in their 20s and 30s. And a couple years ago, it was at 200. Now it, it surely has to be over 500, possibly 600 that have friended me or reached out to me in other ways. And these are frequently pastors of churches. And yeah. though a lot of those churches like yours are actually still using the King James Version mm -hmm. for the very same reason that you are and I, I I get that like I understand that and that's probably what I would do in that circumstance sure you know, try to take sure. it slow they are not talking about the King James the same way that their predecessors did that's and right. they are not dividing from other believers over this I do think that a lot of the strength of the movement is going to be leached out. That is certainly my prayer. And I know that is your prayer as well. And Michael, I just want to thank you for your time. I want to thank oh, you for your you. humility. Let's not have a mutual admiration society here, but let's recognize the good of the Spirit when Amen. the Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit within us. Yeah. It is not we that get the glory, but God himself. Um, he's the one who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Amen. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it.